Namaste and welcome to my channel. You're watching the first video from the series Sanskrit for the Beginners. I decided to film those videos because I heard this question a lot from the yoga instructors or from the yoga practitioners. Do I really need to learn Sanskrit to be a better uh, teacher or to be a dedicated practitioner? So my answer is always no, you don't have to do that. But I'm a believer that the Sanskrit is a very important part of the yogic tradition, of the yogic culture. And by learning it, you will obtain these tools which will help you to discover the more meaning, the more understanding of the ancient texts, of some certain words and certain techniques. So it definitely will enrich your practice and will enrich your uh, teacher experience as well. So my intention for these videos is not to dive too deep into the grammar or to not necessarily teach you how to translate the complicated stanzas from the Yoga Sutras. No, I want to give you just a taste of this language and just I want you to have this experience to learn Sanskrit, to start learning Sanskrit, even if it's just the basic. Because for me, just the learning Sanskrit is a unique experience, as almost as a dynamic meditation. And I'm sure if you decide to join me on this journey, you will understand what I'm talking about. I'm going to um, do the new video for this topic every week at Friday. So if you don't want to miss the new video, please subscribe on my channel and um, turn on the notifications. So every time when the new video will come out live on my channel, you will be notified about it. So today the first class and we're going to talk about the numbers. The numbers has almost a mystical meaning in all the yogic uh, texts and yogic stories and just in India, in India in general. If you read all the stories, you might be noticed that it's always a certain amount of people, saints, children, whatever. This number is kind of always uh, mentioning here and there. So through the numbers, the people kind of uh, try to transfer the certain uh, meaning, the additional meaning uh, to what you already see or hear in the stories. And today we're going to take a look at numbers from 0 to 9. I will be showing you how you would write the number in Sanskrit because it's quite different from what we used to see, how you will pronounce it, and give you just a few examples of how this number can be used in a different words. If you already practice yoga, you might be will be familiar with these words, but it's always interesting, you know, maybe you will get to know that um, this word actually was translated differently or maybe that's why this word has a certain meaning so i'm sure all of you will find something new in this uh, simple a few minutes class so if you're ready maybe grab a pen to write down some information for yourself and we're going to start from the zero shunya zero shunya pronouncing with the long u the example for this one is going to be just the same word, shunya or shunyata. Also has a meaning of void or emptiness. Very often you can encounter this word in a Buddhism teaching, which is also referred to the state of meditation. Eka, one. Very often used in the names of asymmetrical postures. Just like one you see on the picture, Ekapada Galavasana, literally translating as a one-legged pose dedicated to Galava, and Galava is the name of the sage. So in this case, Ekapada means one leg or one foot. And another name for this pose is Flying Pigeon Pose. Dva, two. Dvipada Sharshasana, two feet behind the head pose. Dvapada, once they joined together, the word dva changed its vowel, so it became the word dvipada. And again, the alternative name for this pose is turtle pose. Three, three. Trikanasana, triangle pose. 
the name of this post looks pretty short, but it's actually three words in there. So three means three, kona, angle or corner, and asana, in this case, pose. The number three also has um, a very tight symbolical representation of the sound om, and it's vocative. So if you look at om and sound om, you notice that it's actually three sounds, a, u, m, and diagrammatic aspect as well. So you see the symbol om, it's actually three parts. The bottom part, the biggest one, the middle part, and the top part, this little point on the very top. Chatur, four. Chaturanga Dandasana, four-limbed staff pose. Chatur is four, Anga, limb. We'll encounter this word one more time in this class. Dandasana, Danda, staff, and Asana, pose. Pancha, five. Pancha Karma, you see this little symbol as a wave above the end. It makes the sound very, very soft. Pancha Karma, literally translating as a five actions. And that is the name of the Ayurvedic procedure, which is emphasizing the detoxification of the body. Includes basti, herbalized oil enemas, nasya, nasal irrigation, vamana, therapeutic vomiting, virachana, purgation, rakta mokshana, bloodletting. I think in the modern uh, way, they uh, removed the vomiting and bloodletting right now and left only the oil and herbal treatment. Shat, six. Very similar word from we had before, Shat Karma, and the translation in six actions. In the traditional yogic text, Shat Karma is the cleansing on the physical body as a preparation for the other practices of yoga, such as asana, breathing, or meditation. And it includes the hauti, the cleansing of the stomach, basti, of the intestine, neti, the cleansing of nasal passages, trataka, the gaze, focusing at one point and in a way the cleansing of the eyes, nauli, massage of internal organs, and kapalabhati, vigorous breath, and kapalabhati translating as a shining skull. Sapta, seven. Sapta Rishi, translating as the seven sages. The name Sapta Rishi very often can be found in the ancient texts, and they consider to be a father of the Vedic tradition, but also the word Sapta Rishi can be found in ancient Indian astronomy. The constellation of the Big Dipper or Semajar is called Sapta Rishi, and the seven stars representing seven Rishis. They've been given names Vasishta, Marichi, Pulastya, Pulaha, Atri, Angiras, and Kratu. Maybe a couple of these names sounds familiar for you due to the names of the asanas, which was dedicated to uh, the sages, to the rishis, such as Vasishthasana or Marichiasana. Ashta, eight. Ashtanga, and here is this word anga once again, eight limbs. Now, uh, don't get confused with the name of the style of yoga, uh, Ashtanga Vinyasa. That's a little bit different, and that's a um, name been given by Patanjali in his Yoga Sutras to the yoga practice. And you can see this beautiful uh, flower we have here in the picture, and it has eight petals. Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. All of these words as a certain aspect of the practice, 
practice we're not going to dive too deep here at this video but uh, the thing here is that often Ashtanga is translating as an eighth step of yoga but in reality you can see that it's actually limbs or petals so it's changing the whole perceptions so instead of climbing the steps you should actually practice them all simultaneously because all eight limbs or eight petals has to exist simultaneously Nava nine a very festive example our last one Navaratri nine nights Navaratri is a festival in India which is taking place every year at fall and it's dedicated to the goddesses uh, so the goddess and with a few aspects and the first three days is dedicated to Durga the goddess of courage and strength the second three days to Lakshmi the goddess of wealth not only physical or material but also the spiritual Saraswati the goddess of knowledge or goddess the music as well so as you understood it called nine nights or Navaratri because of the duration of this festival so that is it for today thank you for watching this video and I hope it was uh, educational for you as I said videos will be coming up every week so don't forget to subscribe and turn on the notifications so you will never miss the new video thank you for watching again and I hope to see you in the next week.